thanks for joining us, and uh, let's get started. So, first of all, why are we here? What, uh, what's the deal here? So, um, to put it simply, the, uh, the automotive industry has a new tool for building rich and responsive user interfaces in cars. Uh, and that tool is Unreal Engine. Um, as you, as many of you know, uh, there is a lot to Unreal Engine and its suite of tools. I've got a few highlighted here. Um, you got the Quixel suite of tools with Mega Scans and Quixel Mixer uh, and Quixel Bridge for bringing in uh, amazing assets and materials uh, and textures for uh, making rich. Uh, user experiences in Unreal Engine. And then recently we had the MetaHuman Creator, which was announced, which allows you to build uh, realistic looking humans uh, in your real-time applications uh, very quickly. Um, there are many, many more tools uh, available with Unreal Engine. Um, and every single one of these tools can be used inside a user interface in a car. Uh, and so this is really, really great because we're now having this convergence of not only this new technology in, in the automotive industry, but also this community of, of experts and people with really, uh, really great skills um, that can, you know, make their mark on, on automotive industry, you know. Um, there are uh, lots of people's, you know, favorite car brands uh, now uh, have this amazing tool for creating uh, really nice UIs. And so um, the, that was the, that very idea which inspired the, the uh, HMI design uh, challenge that we're running and also uh, creating this template uh, for people to be able to try out their ideas. And so with uh, this new uh, technology in Unreal Engine for HMI, you really have this ability to do rapid uh, user interface creation and rapid iteration uh, uh, and design of your HMI. And the idea here is that you use Unreal Engine uh, in the virtual sense where you have this virtual interior, these virtual screens. You are basically unlocked to do whatever you want uh, with no limitation. Uh, because you're in the virtual world, so you can choose the the resolution of your screens, you can choose the size of them, where they go, where they fit, uh, and then once you're happy with the with your concept in the virtual uh, world, then you can translate the interior into the physical world, and then that digital content that you designed can just translate uh, use, since it's Unreal Engine you can just translate that digital content very easily uh, onto the display, uh, the real display um, that you have. And so this is a very, very uh, efficient and <laughs> cheap way to uh, prototype uh, actual user interface designs. And uh, we hope that this can, uh, this, this enablement of designers in the HMI field will uh, empower them to create uh, better uh, HMI designs. So uh, we're really excited for that. Well, thank you, everybody. And now let's hand it off to Vince, who's going to walk you through the template. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everybody. My name is Vince. I'm a technical artist here on the HMI team. I'm going to be showing you all through the HMI Design Challenge template project, which is basically a way to get started really quickly with this challenge. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, first thing you'll want to do is download the content from the marketplace. It's really easy. All you have to do is search for HMI and you'll find this. You'll create a blank project in 427 and then you can add this content to that project. Once you do that, you'll be presented with a bunch of content right here. And if you go to the HMI design template um, folder, you can look at the maps folder and there are two maps here. The one we're looking at right here is the vehicle stage. So this vehicle stage is kind of like where you're going to be doing your creative design work. And the, the assets here are pretty simple. And it was something I put together in maybe one or two days. So, uh, and it was a lot of fun. It was just kind of like, I had no design in mind. I was just kind of 
freestyling here in Unreal Engine. So I think it's a, it's a really good idea to do something like that. Or if you have something in mind and you've always been wanting to build it, maybe this is a good excuse to jump right in. So what we're looking at here is essentially a very simplified vehicle interior. The idea here is that these meshes shouldn't detract from your HMI design. It's basically here is just a placeholder um, so that you can put your screens or virtual concepts and, and content in, in context. Um, interesting alliteration there. <laughs> so uh, if we look at uh, the screens here, there's um, three distinct sc screens in this uh, that are set up already. Um, I'm gonna go ahead the G key and I can see that I have some of my content already set up. I'm gonna slow my camera down. And um, essentially what's happening here is there are render targets, which are kind of off in the space over here, which are paired with individual blueprints. And each one of these individual blueprints can be def uh, configured to um, change size. So if I click on one of these screen placers, you'll see it, it has a name, screen placer two, and it has an RT ref. BP RT group two. So essentially what that means is when I place one of these in the scene, I also need a corresponding blueprint, which is the RT group. So this is a screen where you're presenting your content and the RT group is where you're recording that content. So uh, for example, I have this screen over here that's showing some like tr yeah, trendy looking <laughs> um, map. Um, and Obviously that content's not right here. If you look over here, you can see that it's actually just a jaunt over and I can select my blueprint here. And you can see here, it's looking through to all this content down here. It's being rendered to a render target. And then that's being shown over here on screen. Um, typically, uh, so if you see this project, it's not really like, this isn't built for HMI that would be deployed on a device, right? This isn't what you'd be shipping on your vehicle. This is just a stage for um, designing an HMI and putting it in context of an interior. So really, really simple. Um, so we have this map, cool design, just came up with it off the cuff. Um, and then uh, just a digital gauge cluster that's based off an analog one. Um, if you're a fan of classic Nissan vehicles, you might know what inspired this. Um, and then we have kind of what would be a projection onto windshield or, you know, a HUD element, um, which has transparency. So that's another thing that this supports. Um, so let's take a look at one of these real quick. I want to select one of the screen placers here and I can see in its default uh, section, there is a resolution here. So uh, I can easily change this to anything I want. So. Uh, and do be careful here because render targets um, are basically another screen. So you are rendering another screen that is at this resolution. So the more you add in the higher resolution you have, the more taxing it's going to be on your machine. So just keep that in mind when you're designing. If you're having slow performance, maybe it might be a good idea to reduce the resolution. So uh, yeah, I have a screen here that's um, and it's a portrait alignment. Let's go ahead and change that. I can change that to... 720 by 1080, which is essentially just going to change this from a portrait to a landscape. And after I enter some values, I can um, refresh my render target and you can see that it quickly changed the scale and the aspect ratio. So that's changing the render target resolution that's rendering over there. And if I wanted to, like this is too large now, I can go ahead and, and scale this down turn off snapping so it's pretty simple like you can create pretty much any scale of screen that you want so let's say this is a much wider screen we're starting to see that a lot in the industry um, actually this isn't even that wide it's these screens are getting really really wide so you can have all sorts of freedom to move this and place it in your vehicle and kind of come up with a design configuration of the screens first, and then you can design your actual content next. Right, so let's go ahead and, um, well, before I move here, uh, let's take a look at the, the pairing here. So this is an actor reference. So if there's something in your level, this can reference here. You can see that it's, it's linked to a specific class, um, which is the BP 
RT group class. So let's say I wanted to make a new one of these. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to duplicate that. That's fine. And I have a new screen placer here. It's using the same RT group, so that's why it's rendering black. Um, let's go ahead and find one of our RT groups that we have. You can see things are cataloged here in different groups. Um, so let's see. I'm just going to make a duplicate. And you can see that when you do that, you'll get your labels updated. So I have a group four now. If I come back here to my screen. I can go back to my reassignment and look at my group four and uh, refresh. And now I have my new screen. It's got a new aspect ratio. It's got a new camera. So if I can align this just right, you can see that this is updating live. Uh, perhaps it's too far away to grab. But uh, ah, I was grabbing the screen there or the dome. But yeah, you can see that it's quite easily updating and um, it looks just like that. So that's the idea. So you want to place more screens or you just wanted to get rid of these screens and add your own. Um, that's where you can do that. So uh, another thing that we want, so eventually when you finish this project and, and you want to show it off, you want to enter it in the contest, what we need is a video. Um, so what you want to do is you create your content, um, you animate it, which we'll talk about next, and then you want to record a video. So if I hit play, um, I'm immediately seeing an animated sequence where there's tons of stuff happening. So um, there's animation on the dials, um, there's animation on the camera, um, and this is great. This is um, what we were trying to see um, from you guys is basically a, a delivery that's, that's an example of your HMI kind of in motion. Uh, and then I do a breakdown here of just what things look like um, as individuals. So that's what we're looking for. Um, you can edit this sequence however you want. If you go to the cinematics, you can look at the overview capture. This is just kind of like a standard um, camera setup and it's just moving things back and forth. But if you noticed, if I look at my cinematics, there's also this data simulation. So here we have um, a reference to a blueprint called the BP data handler. So essentially what's happening is there is a blueprint in this scene on a tick is being updated and streaming this data to all of the listening actors, which is the listening actors of this class or anything that can subscribe to that data. And we'll show that in just a sec. But the idea here is that you can simulate your driving data right here. Keyframe animation for things like cardinal direction, um, drive mode, engine RPM, gear index, all these other things, um, which is great. So you can add any sort of data. HMI is all based off data, right? Cars have lots of sensors. They do lots of things. We ingest that data in Unreal, and then we display that somewhere. Um, so you can go ahead and um, add different tracks here and start animating. Um, this is based off of a data asset, which has a list of variables. So each one of these is a variable, and that's derived from a list. Um, so let's look at the, um, the data handler. So this is spawned in the sequencer, so you will not see it in the scene unless you have this sequence open. But I can go ahead and uh, take a look at this data asset and the data handler blueprint. So let's look at the blueprint first. If I take a look here, you can see that on an event tick, we're running this event right here. And essentially this is taking um, set variables, which are duplicates of the data asset. And I know this is getting a little bit confusing for some of you designers, but um, that's totally fine. Essentially what's happening here is the sequence is communicating with this blueprint, which has variables. And those variables are then being set to the data asset reference. Um, and what's cool about that is that uh, the data asset has a bunch of variables in it, but you can do some stuff with those variables. So like, for example, I can convert an index to text. So this is taking the gear index 
and it's assigning a string value rather than being just a number. So I could put neutral, I could put whatever I want, or I could put a reverse. That's what's happening here. So all that like calculations is happening and then being set to the data asset. And if we look at that data asset, you can see that there is a pre-configured list of these variables. Um, so say you wanted to add your own variable. Um, we have a few here, but say like you want to add anything you want. Um, what you'd want to do is take a look at the primary data asset. Double click on that and you open it up. And you can see that there's a list of variables here. You can easily add one here. We could call this test pool. Compile it, save it. Take a look at my data asset. So primary data asset is the um, parent class and then data asset is a child of that class and you can see quickly that the test pool has now showed up so if I wanted to start animating that um, what I need to do is make a duplicate down here so we'll call this test pool and this will be accessible to the sequence only if we choose this little button right here to expose to cinematics compile that get it and then this is a reference down here to that data asset that we created um, the original variable for. So I can just set test bool. Stay nice and tidy, of course. And now I can go back to my sequence, oh, which is already open. Add a track, and you can see test pool is down there. Now that test pool is there because I created the variable again in this data ass or in this um, this blueprint. It's not deriving it directly from the data asset, so it's a little bit of extra steps. But what it does is makes this really easy to pick up somewhere else. So this is all the setting the data. Now the fun part is to actually use that data somehow. So. We had these, um, these needles were animating before, right? So where's that coming from? Well, if I come over here and I look at the content that's being rendered on screen, well, how about I do it like this? I have my content here and let's take a look at one of these needles. You can see that I have a specific class of um, animated needles. Um, and um, the data type is being set. And being interpreted by this fecal data here, which is an instance of that data asset. So remember, we're, we're using this other blueprint to animate these values. And then this blueprint, which is totally separate from that other one, because it's referring that data asset, can use it and then animate by basically taking the max engine RPM whether it's attack or speedo, um, and then lerping that between a range. So this is degrees, zero degrees to 220 degrees, which is which I determined is how far it needs to rotate. Um, and then it's setting the relative rotation of SM needle. It's just that easy. So it's, it's really simple. Um, and what you're basically doing is just animating your own data and then interpreting that any way you want. So, um, for example, if I just make a duplicate of that, I move it up, um, it's still linked to the speedo. I can go ahead and play. And you can see that I have my sequence open here, um, but it'll still play. Obviously it's off screen now, but you can see that it's animating. So because it's subscribing to that data asset, it gets that animation data, which is really cool. All right, well, so that's kind of the breakdown of all the bits and pieces. Um, there's also a blueprint here for, um, for uh, uh, well, so let's take a look at it. It's a look at camera manager. So what this is, is a way to help you kind of see things through a camera view. Um, if you look over here, I have this cluster of camera views. And essentially what this is, is just a way to scroll through these at runtime. So if I take a look at this blueprint over here in this section, there are references to each one of these cinematic cameras, which are set up to be a specific view. And if I wanted to, what I could do is turn off the capture uh, sequence, which starts automatically. If I turn that off, you can see that now 
I have control to move the camera to all these screens because I've predefined those cameras and now I'm just kind of moving around. I think generally speaking you'll want to run without that sequencer open. Um, right, so when you're designing and you want to look through like a, a, a camera, you just set this up and press a key. You can see that those keys are pre-configured to C and L. C to switch through any one of these and L to start a loop and then there's a little bit of variables here to configure how fast it does all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Um, please go ahead and, and, and pull this project and start having fun. Like I said, I had no intentions and like, like no design uh, ideas in mind before I started adding this content. I spent one or two days just kind of throwing it all together and having fun. Um, and that's kind of the point. You know, back in the day, we used to have things like game jams. And, and, and this is kind of a substitute for when we used to be able to do that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, grab it, have fun, and uh, we're going to go into the details of the rest of the, of the HMI design challenge uh, with the rest of the webinar. Thanks so much. Wow, that was awesome, Vince. Uh, what a cool project and what a, what a great uh, introduction to HMI for people who have not been using it and they're interested about it. This is a really great entry point in this design challenge, being focused on just making really beautiful visuals that, that tell a compelling story in an automotive context is really interesting. So I just wanted to kick it to James to begin the questions and get you know your perspective on industry trends in, in HMI and, and the relevance and the importance that it has for, for manufacturers and brands kind of in 2022. Thanks. Thanks, Daryl. Yes, no, uh, great presentation from Vint. Um, yes, HMI, it's an, it's an interesting thing. It's been around, obviously, um, for, for a long, long time, as, as, as for as long as we've had uh, machines. But the, 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 um, the main thing that the industry is facing at the moment is the speed of technolog technological change and how they sort of adapt. Um, there are increasing sort of uh, customer expectations for what a car can do on the interior. Um, it, it, there was slow incremental change and then all seemed to happen at once with the dawn of the digital age. And to be fair, some car brands um, are making a good fist of it. Others are finding it a challenge. There are, there are sort of schools of thought developing around um, what makes a good human machine interface. Uh, largely, the debate is centered around the, the use of screens at the moment. Um, to screen or not to screen most most oems or brand car brands have, have gone um gone for screens led by tesla of course um but there's been kind of debates over safety too much information um what could be a, a very nuanced and an interesting experience in terms of um hmi that would help you build a sort of strong emotional um, bond between customer and and car um, and car brand uh, can get a bit convoluted and confusing if if uh, essential controls you say are buried between the sort of sub menus and, and things like that there there are sort of myriad possibilities but there are lots of pitfalls as as well um Yes, some are making a better, better, um, a better job of it than others. Um, but it is, it is a huge opportunity. You know, you the the interior of the car is where you where you sort of form your kind of strong emotional connection to it. Um, uh, and and often that was kind of manifest in things like switch gear and and the touch and feel of things. Um, but now it's there's there's potential for a lot more nuance and a lot more depth to the to the whole thing. But providing you uh, providing you get it right. <laughs> yes, that's 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 the tricky part, right? That's what this design challenge is all about. Just coming yes. up with unique, fresh ideas. And I'm sure I'm sure the users out there are going to submit some stuff that we're just going to be like, that's really interesting. Never thought of that. So hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone downloads the the marketplace asset that Vince got set up for you and you use that as your, your foundation, your jumping off point. Now, here's a question, Joe. This is kind of a theme of questions came in, several of them talking about what can we do, what can't we do? Um, so maybe you can just tell, tell you know, re reinforce how yeah. open this really is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the uh, design challenge is open to anyone and everyone. Um, and with that, we understand that there will be teams uh, doing it. There will be uh, students doing it that, you know, maybe don't have a ton of time. Maybe you're working on finals or studying hard and, you know, you're, you're, you don't have a ton of time to build an entire HMI design and that's okay. Uh, we want, you know, if, if all you have the time for is for an instrument cluster, 
design, then, or you have a really great idea for an instrument cluster design, you haven't thought of a, of a HMI design for a center uh, screen or anything like that, that's totally fine. Um, do what you can and uh, and and use all of the tools that that you know we have with with the Quixel Mega Scans, with the uh, Unreal Marketplace, with all these different things, and 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 have fun with it. You know, it's it's uh, uh, there are a lot of artists and designers out there who are not in HMI who drive in a car or, or have driven in a car, and I'm sure you've looked at the screen and you thought, man, like. I can I can do something with that, you know. I I I could now. So now's your chance. Now's your chance to to give it a try. Excellent. So another kind of theme of questions or bucket of questions that came in were all around data and, and data sources and just in general how like HMI work. I think you know some of the people that are coming to this webinar aren't in the HMI industry. They're they're coming from a variety of different backgrounds that use Unreal. So maybe Vince, you can just give a, a quick kind of high level overview of like what HMI is and how it kind of all connects together inside of a vehicle. Right. So like you said, it's all about data. Um, so the vehicle is doing a lot of things um, at any given moment. And when we're designing HMIs, what we want to try and do is interpret all that data into a way that's consumable by the users and, and it makes sense and it complements the rest of the design of the car. Um, so when I'm in the engine or when I'm in, you know, Unreal Engine, um, I'm taking these streams of data and I'm finding out how I can use them. So obviously the, the low hanging fruit is like making needles move up and down. Um, but we also had things like examples in that, in that data asset, like drive mode, like how can drive mode influence the feel of an HMI? How does state changes look? Um, so it's, it's all about kind of um, it's all about the data. It's, it's really just being able to interpret that data and use it in blueprints. And essentially that's what that data asset does. It, it simplifies the, what you'd normally be receiving through an API um, through, you know, regular channels. Excellent. So another, another kind of broad question about how, how, do, how do we work with the assets? People are, are curious, you know, can I use other applications to help like Photoshop or Illustrator or something like that? So maybe Vince or Joe could, could uh, you know, let people... Yeah. Yeah, that. sure. So, so we um, expect people to use uh, all the tools at their disposal. Uh, if you uh, are using Figma to create images uh, to, or or widget uh, widget images, and you want to import those, you can export those as as images and import them into Unreal UMG, um, and then build uh, build your widgets that way. If you have Photoshop and you're you're um, texturing something or creating some kind of image in Photoshop, that's fine. You're using Maya to create some sort of 3D um, model of something, maybe uh, you want to model, maybe the screen that you're looking at is actually looking at a 3D stage. Um, and maybe maybe you have some kind of 3D design. You know, it's it's totally open in that sense. Um, you, if you want, you can use the Quixel uh, library of assets. You don't have to do that either. Um, also, like the type of... of um, you know, tune shaders and all kinds of things you can, materials you can apply, like it's, it's wide open in that sense too. So um, we, we intentionally made the design template generic uh, because we don't want to uh, suggest any kind of design language or anything. Uh, we want people to, to be able to come up with that uh, themselves. Excellent. So here's another question, and I, I I can take this one. Someone's asking if is if they if they're working with the template and they have a virtual cockpit, can they put VR on and, and play around with it in VR just to see what it looks like and from from a first person perspective? And it's just vanilla vanilla uh, Unreal really at this point. So anything that you could do in Unreal, you can you can do in this in this project. I assume is that correct, Vince? Yeah, that's totally right. Um, you know, the only main concern is if if you're designing in Unreal and you're using all these render targets. Um, just be, keep an eye on performance, you know, um, you don't want to make yourself sick. So um, just stay safe. Yeah. And and that's another thing that to maybe Joe, you could elaborate about performance and, and, you know, what are we, are we setting benchmarks? Like it needs to run on this mobile renderer or anything like that, or is it how, you know, how. Yeah. Open is yeah, no. So uh, the performance of this is, 
is not necessarily a consideration. Just keep in mind that the, for the submission of the project, it's uh, a sequencer recording. So you're submitting a video for the competition. And uh, you definitely want your HMI to run smoothly and performant uh, in that sense. Um, but uh, we are intentionally, um, this competition is kind of separating out um, you know, production design versus concept design. And, and, and we want people to, to not worry about that. We want them to focus on the visual look and feel. Um, uh, and actually I know, I know James, you, you had a brief um, for, uh, for the competition. Well, that kind of talks about that a little bit. Uh, maybe we can, we can cover that. I could sort of have a quick canter through that if you, if you like. Um, yeah. So no, I, um, so so the Unreal Engine HMI Design Challenge. So so you know, it's a community community based challenge. We're looking for designers and hobbyists. I'm sure either of you, me, people watching, may feel, fall into one or two of those buckets or both at the same time. Um, to to create concepts that revolutionise the traditional human machine interface and provide a glimpse into the future of in vehicle experiences, and the um, how we'd like you to use it. We'd like you to use the HMI design to to make a driver feel adventurous or luxurious or sporty, and to sort of judge the the um, how how well you've accomplished that task. We've got representatives from General Motors, Mercedes Benz. Nissan and Rivian, and they're going to be the expert panel for the cha- uh, for the challenge. They're going to assess how well you've done in, in incorporating a polished HMI into the design, whilst considering those three things: adventure, luxury, or sport, um, it, to co- create that feel of, for passengers in the cockpit. And as Joe said, this is this is going to be assessed purely on design language. So it's it's not wor- not worrying about sort of um, implementation. Um, we really want you to sort of. Go go as wild as you can with your ideas um, uh, and along those those three themes. Um, it's open to anyone. We we um, you know there's going to be uh, we mentioned hobbyists, but you know architects, artists, game playing designer. You may you may be all of those things or, or none of those things. But it's um, it's a great opportunity to, to get involved and have your work reviewed by design leads from uh, from those top um, uh, car brands. And yes, I think the uh, the only the only criteria we just want you to use the same um, design templates for the contest. Um, but beyond that, yeah, we just, we're, we're very much looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Definitely. And I think it's interesting, the panel of judges you were able to assemble uh, is, is really, it, it, I think it, it drives to the point of how important this is for the manufacturers. Oh, absolutely. You're thinking about this. I'm sure you're hearing this, like you talk to OEMs every day. What, mm-hmm. what do you we hear do. them say? Yes, well, they're all looking for answers. I think uh, I don't know if they're going to, you know, they maybe the some will some will um, pop up in uh, in some of the submissions, but um, it is it is quite the, the thorny issue that they're all trying to grasp and, and make sense of. Um, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's it's kind of the opportunity you have to really forge a sort of long and deep connection with your with your customer. Um, and we see all sorts of concepts, of course, beyond you know trying to work the air conditioning through to to um, you know the, with the rise of autonomous driving, the, the sort of multi the multifunctional nature of potential interior car interior, everything from you know having having your sort of your almost a concierge or tour guide, you know, telling you what's going on outside while you relax over the, with a cappuccino, to you know having a kind of you know social gathering within. I mean it really stretches the boundaries of what a car is to be honest um but it's all tied into the, to the same thing the, you know the technology the speed of change is moving um and and the potential is is there as is the potential to 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 cock it up i'm quite frankly <laughs> yeah it seems like an exciting future though right like if 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 this digital cockpit becomes more and more prevalent and becomes just a key part of the experience of the vehicle this can be uh, they're going to need a lot of talent to make this because every car is going to need it and maybe it changes right like it's like the over the air update times 10 like today I'm, well, I'm having this experience on my car tomorrow it's another experience well it does it does throw interesting questions into the mix doesn't it because if, if you look at the traditional uh, ownership model of a car the, the big argument against owning a car was that you buy it you drive it off the lot and you lose 30 percent of the value but Say say it improved every year with COVID over the air updates. You know that and it became more valuable, and it became it learned, and it, and it kind of and it gathered information, and, and it became better every year. I mean, that's quite a strange concept, but but you know, not not beyond the realms of possibility. 
Excellent. So another technical question. Someone was asking about Linux support. Um, so maybe you could talk about uh, Linux and and you know actually what what HMI is running on, like what type of hardware it would be comparable to that that people might have at their house, like from a from a power perspective and things like that. Maybe Joe or Vince, you could you could jump into that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I can cover a little bit of that. So um uh, excuse me. So uh yeah, the we cover all kinds of um different platforms. Uh primarily in the market we have QNX, um, Android, and Linux. Uh, those are the, the main ones. Um, for, for designers, uh, uh, we see them using um, Windows, uh, Mac, and, and, and also some use Linux as well. Um, and so uh, for the design challenge, the target platform is not like uh, for whatever production it will be is not so much important uh, because Unreal Engine, uh, for the most part, is platform agnostic. So if you implement a design on on Windows, that design can translate over to whatever platform you're working on. That's part of the power of the engine. Um, and and actually, you know, during this the pandemic, it's been a, a huge uh, uh, advantage. You know, because hardware is scarce, as we all know, uh, and and so you don't always get to work on the final hardware. So um, it it it's totally fine. And in you know, in the industry itself as well, you have uh, hardware as low end as not having 3D acceleration to as high end as being able to do ray tracing and run AAA games. So it the it runs the gamut. Which is kind of why in this design challenge, uh, we don't really, it, it doesn't really matter what, what hardware you're, you're targeting. What's, what's the total focus here is the look and feel and the design. Excellent. So about, about look and feel, someone asked, this is a great one. Can I, can I do a cockpit for a drone or underwater vehicle? So I, I think the answer sounds like it's yes. You can go, yeah. go crazy. It's uh that'd be awesome. Have fun. Do it. <laughs> like, do it. There you go. Um, this is a question, uh, Vince, probably you're well suited to answer. Someone's asking, is there any C code specific to the HMI template or project? No, it was all built in blueprints. Um, it's extremely simple. Um, so, uh, no, if you want to add something, like if you're a coder and you wanted to do some, gosh, I don't know, whatever you'd like, and you want to showcase your work that way, um, that's totally fine. But by itself, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Very, very cool. So we had a session earlier today. Were there any topics, Joe, that, that you thought we that didn't come up in the questions in the second session that you think we, we should you know, maybe reiterate or, or um, give, give some airtime to? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big one is that uh, this is all about design and we're kind of, it's important to think of this as an abstraction away from production um, because Unreal Engine has the ability to bridge the two itself. So you don't, as a designer, when you're designing your UI, you can, uh, especially for a concept, a design concept, you can just use the power of the engine and design whatever concept you you want. And the data points that you're that that Vince pointed out in the data asset that uh, you're using to bring life to your design, those data points can uh, later on be uh, replaced uh, from from. Uh, C++ code and from sensors that uh, come from the production uh, the production uh, system. So as a designer, you really don't care where the data comes from. You just care what type what type the data is. And it's actually really important for a designer to be able to control the types of data that they get because they might have a type of widget or a 3D asset that in, ingests a type of data, and you don't you don't want that designer to be limited to whatever the definition of the CAN bus is or, you know, the, uh, or whatever the, the production system limits it to. Uh, software engineers can translate that data. They can take, you know, what the tech artist wants to use and what the data is, and they can do some processing to translate that data for the artist. So um, it, 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 when it comes to design, you should pick the types of data that you want to show and you should just, just show them. Um, now, of course, within reason, you know, if, if you want to have some super crazy, you know, 3D map that shows all of the stores and highlights the 3D model of, of the store you're going to, um, you know, of course, that's a very futuristic design. And some like I think someday in the future, that will be the case. Um, but but uh, some of the data is just plain, plain simply not there. <laughs> um, so uh, I would say like um, 
you could, uh, since this is all focused on visual design, um, if you get the look and feel of, of the HMI in general, um, then uh, a th whether it's a 3D map or, or how you want to kind of communicate that design, uh, there are different types of, of widgets and things out there you can use to do that. So, so we're kind of coming close to the end of the questions here. Are there anything that you guys want to, uh, any closing thoughts, basically? Maybe we just kind of go around and, and let everybody have a moment to, or if I, if I miss something, you know, like, <laughs> please, please uh, don't be shy. Fill in, fill in the gaps if, I didn't, if we didn't cover something that was important. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's important to consider is just just to have fun. You know, this is kind of like something in place that we'd have for like a game jam or something like that. Um, you don't have to take it so seriously. It, it's supposed to be kind of a creative uh, experiment. So, so you know, the the rules are you deliver a, vi uh, a video at the end of this. So if you you can do basically whatever you want to to get to that point and um, just have fun. Excellent. Jerry, you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know the the contest is focused on design, and uh, you know whether you're a, a student who uses Unreal Engine who's interested in this, or you're a full on team, uh, you know don't you know don't worry about having to deliver an, an entire HMI design if if you don't have time for that. If you do have time for that, great. Um, but you know, if you have a, if you have a idea that's killing you, that's you know, it's the, this instrument cluster design you want to see, um, then then go, just go for that, and and that's totally okay. Um, and and you know, that kind of goes along with the the fun the fun part. You know, just have fun and 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 you know, do what you uh, what you want to do. Sounds great. So James, we will end with you. Any. And closing thoughts for us before we call call it for a day. Um, no, just to have fun. Someone suggested whether they might do a sort of underwater pod. Um, absolutely, we'd love to see that. And again, again, with Joe just saying, you know, if you don't, you know, if you if this is a kind of shed project, metaphorical shed project, and you're doing it in your evening, you know, and you can get a really killer idea for some IP, then I think that's that's um, equally good. Um, I'm just very much looking forward to seeing some of the some of the work that um, you guys submit. Um, and uh, yes, and re really happy to be part of this this uh, this competition. Excellent. Well, we're super excited to be doing it with you guys. Uh, Car Design News is an amazing resource for those of you who haven't been going to it. Make sure you check it out. Vince, great project. Thank you. I learned a lot. Um, it's super fun. And, and Joe, it's always a pleasure. So I'd like to also thank everybody who submitted amazing questions. We got to go through several of them today. And everybody, go out there and have fun. Make something great. And we'll uh, we'll see you all next time. Cheers. Thanks, guys.